we're now going to move on to a kind of another another angle uh, in the philosophy of computing biblically. Further thoughts, we call them further thoughts, or we'll call the ramifications or the results of impact, however you want to frame it. Here's just a note on this. Who we are and what we ultimately believe is significantly the result of the influence of others, of our mentors, of our disciples, however you want to articulate that. I always say that most of my mentors are dead, meaning I, I, I learned from the scriptures, the patriarchs, the men and women of God who walked with God for a lifetime, finished strong, reproduced, multiplied. Here we are today as a result of Jesus' investment of the 12 who reproduced and multiplied to the ends of the earth. And here we are thousands of miles away talking about Jesus and Nazareth because he invested in a few who reproduced and thus multiplied. That's, that's the fascinating, that's the master plan. That's the master plan of evangelism and discipleship. And it's, it's, his, it's his one plan. It's the only plan. It's the plan he knew would succeed. It was the victorious plan. And that's a plan that we're attempting to implement within the context of, of sport. And so I've mentioned how, for me, reading a book by a mentor who I never met until oh, many decades after I read the book, a guy named Wes Neal mentored me in these things. And then I ran into another gentleman who mentored or discipled me. He was a spiritual father. I consider disciplers fathers and mentors like uncles. I had an uncle named Wes Neal who I hadn't met. I had a disciple or a father named Frosty Western who I had met. These are people that God used whose shoulders I'm now standing upon. Other players, coaches, uh, people influential in the sport world that allowed this to germinate in my thinking as I observed it and then began to practice it with supervision of the Holy Spirit through people and then begin to instruct others in it. Teacher always learns more than the student. And so we want to move from, from learners and followers and apprentices and students to be leaders and mentors and disciples so that we can reproduce. This is all our thinking about these things. We want people to have an opportunity to see a different way to play, a different way to coach, a different way to uh, appreciate sport or observe it or be a fan of it that has eternal redemptive impact and isn't just about fun and relaxed, though it is that also. Uh, I'm talking pretty ferociously about a philosophy, but I can also say I never, ever, ever experienced the fun, the pleasure. Frosty talked about enjoying the trip, the process. All aspects of the sport experience was enhanced supernaturally because of this philosophy, which is why it's become so much who I am. Not just because I was transformed by the inside out, it also happened to be the most encouraging, elevating, uh, redemptive, reconciling vehicle I've ever seen, as I have attempted to articulate. We stand on the shoulders of others. No one stands alone. Whose shoulders are you standing on? And whose shoulders will you provide for somebody else to stand on you? That's the part where this then becomes reproductive and thus eventually multiplying if you continue reproducing. Reproducers of this philosophy. What are the ramifications of the integration? Here's some questions. Are we aware of how much impact sports has on the lives of individuals? on and off the field. Think about it. Just think about how the world is, uh, uh, boy, what's the word for it? Enamored is not strong enough. For how, how sport has captured a large segment of the population. Think about in America, how many people on any given week attend or observe, whether it's in TV or in person, a sporting event, how many people have somebody in their circle of their family, of their friends, of their associates that is playing or coaching or going to a sporting event in the United States of America. And other cultures are even more ferocious than we are because we have so many other avenues of entertainment besides sport. And in other countries, that, that's, the, that's their driving force. Go to some of these foreign countries about soccer or about whatever sport is, is unique or particular to their country. 
I mean, it consumes them. It does in America too, some people, but in other cultures and other countries, uh, they, they put us to shame in terms of their commitment and their uh, focus on these things. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying this is the reality of the impact of sport. Are we aware of that impact? I know we're aware of it because if we talked about it, we'd say, yeah, billions and billions of dollars are spent. But are we, are we thinking about it in terms of the ramifications of that, of how God could use that and wants to use that and will use that if we but partner with him in the process of sport, our playing, our coaching, our participating casually, uh, whether it's just softball or just going out and rock climbing, whatever it is that qualifies us under the umbrella of sport, are we leveraging that? I go back to that comment of Dr. Coleman. Why would anybody play a round of golf if they wouldn't do it to advance the kingdom? It's just a fascinating articulation that has merit to consider um, about why that would be. Now, some people, again, would say you're being too freakish. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're too intense over this issue. Well, all I know is people are dying. They're dying literally uh, uh, in terms of physical death. They're dying spiritually every day. And if they physically die, once they're dead, they're eternally damned if they have not in a born-again experience. Uh, it's a pretty serious matter. Doctrine of both, we call it. At the same time, sport is meant to be enjoyed. The trip is meant to be enjoyed. There's tremendous pleasure, satisfaction, redemptive capacity. So even as we're ferociously talking about it, about advancing the kingdom, that doesn't, that doesn't diminish the fact of how fulfilling and fun and enjoyable and relaxing and, and, and refreshing sport can be. You don't, it's not one or the other. I can tell you in the most intense climates that I've been at, in as a player and as a coach, that it was incredibly fun in the process of that kind of intensity, the pleasure of enjoying the sport, enjoying the game, enjoying competition, enjoying each other, enjoying the battle, right? He always has said, enjoy the battle, enjoy the trip, Frosty did. We're, we're dulled into being passive and to be uh, just entertained by instead of participants in sport. This is about advancing the kingdom and it's also about enjoying the trip. And somehow or another, supernaturally, when you play, According to the word, by his power, for his glory, you get the whole enchilada, I call it. You get the internal and external, you get the intrinsic and the extrinsic, extrinsic value of sport that God designed it for. This is our belief. Second point, um, are we aware of how much impact sport has on our culture? Not only in the individual lives of people, but on culture. Think about how culture is impacted. Think about you know, lived here in, uh, in in Tacoma, in the Seattle area, with when the Seahawks were in a high a few years ago, and, and how the city it, it, it engages a city, it engages countries, it en engages teams. It's amazing how much impact success of a team in a localized area can have. How how useful that can be for the kingdom, or it can be missed, it can be lost. I think I used uh, last class some example of. Teams that, you know, confessed Jesus. Both teams confessed Jesus. They were in schools that confessed Jesus. The teams confessed Jesus. In fact, in both schools, you had to sign a confession that you were a Jesus follower. But in their contest, there was not anything that visually as a spectator, I saw nothing that advanced the kingdom. It was just about the game and the outcome. And it wasn't leveraged for eternity. The contents, the contest wasn't used the way it could be. I've seen games used to advance the kingdom. And I've seen games used to advance self and selfishness and personal pleasure and, and ego and pride. That's, that's the normative view of sport. But I've seen the opposite. I've seen the power of how, how the sport has been used to advance the kingdom and transform lives. And once you taste that, you don't go back to the world because it's, it's so, it's so, it, the, the valuelessness of it compared to when God climbs inside a sporting event or an individual and glorifies his name, what happens there is a holy, holy, 
holy thing. Makes you weep if the Spirit of God is within you. Are we aware of how many opportunities every day within sport to produce life education for all the individuals touched, whether it's the fans, the parents that come to observe a practice or a game or just casual fans or people that just love their team, whatever their motives are, in our communities and a wide variety of real life issues. I remember saying, uh, talking to a particular team about this, about stop practice. Stop practice when you have opportunities to advance life education. To, to, this, we're not talking about the spiritual stuff. I'm just saying principles and things to, to give people to be better husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and friends and workers. Take time to use the sport to develop people in terms of just civil society and life education. Caring, sharing, sacrifice, servant, leadership. All these things are on the table. I had a coach say to me one time, if I stopped every time there was, a, there was an educational moment, we'd never practice. And I said, fair point. Fair point. At some point, you have to, you have to practice because you've got to work on your competencies within the profession. We talked about that last class about it's important to be competent, to be a professional. That doesn't mean a professional like you get paid. To be competent as a man or a woman, you've got to be competent within your profession or within your play. doesn't matter whether you're six or 60. There's a competency that a man or a woman of God is going to evidence when he lives and plays by God's power for his glory, according to the word, right? With a whole heart, a clear mind, strong will, great passion. There's a competency. There's a responsibility to the sport and to people to, to give a whole heart, a clear mind, strong will, great passion. That's a big deal. We talked about that last class. I won't touch on that. Here's some other questions. Do we fundamentally realize the practical and daily potential that lies within sport to transform lives? By the way, we conduct ourselves on and off the field. It isn't just a field deal. This is a lifestyle. This is who you are, not what you do. Within our culture, within our teams, that, that or within our network of thinking about this, that this is who you are. It's not something you do. And, and who you are as a servant leader doesn't stop once you leave the team environment, if that's the case. It goes into the, in college terms, goes into the dorm, in the cafeteria, on Friday nights, when you're home with your family on Thanksgiving. It's who you are. These principles are meant to be practiced as a lifestyle. They're, they're, they're God-honoring. They're God-glorifying. But even if you don't care about God, they're people-enhancing. They're people loving. They're people directed. They're not directed toward productivity. They're directed toward people. When you emphasize productivity, people get squashed. When you emphasize people, they become more productive. Now, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about their productivity on the field. That may be true also. I'm just talking about more productive citizens, family members, friends, workers, society, because there's this there's this caring and sharing and sacrifice and service that's within the fabric of which sport is the educator. Do we seize the opportunities to take advantage of this reality? Do we have adequate vision? A picture of the possibilities. That's why we, we talk about this all the time. I mean, in the sport context, we're always talking about this stuff. I know the players sometimes felt like, yeah, I just, we just want to play, relax. No, no, I'm not going to prostitute you for the sake of a game to use you for an outcome for my enjoyment and pleasure and reputation. And I don't care about you, because as we talked about last class, if you win trophies and awards and, and, uh, and you're remunerated, you, you become a professional, you get paid for it, and you go to hell, that's not a win. If you win the Super Bowl and you go to hell, that's not a win. If you're in the Hall of Fame and you go to hell, that's not a win. If all you have is destructive relationships in your wake because you're self-absorbed and uh, selfish and you can't uh, learn how to love a, a, a wife or a husband or your children, or your neighbors, or your city, that's not a win. This is not, in our opinion. Again, we're coming from a certain position, a particular worldview, a biblical worldview. That's why we call it competing biblically. That may not be your heart. You may just want to do the sport. That's fine. You're going to forfeit, in our opinion, you're going to forfeit these opportunities. For your own best interests. Because I don't know anybody that say, I hope I die, and no, I mean, when I'm dying, I'm in the hospital. I hope nobody shows up. I hope nobody comes around. I hope my family doesn't care. I'm going to roll out all my rings and trophies and I'm going to stare at them as I'm dying and nobody's there because I've never given my life away. I, 
what guy or gal would say that? It's like idiocy, right? And so we're talking about what's really going to last, what's going to matter, even if you don't have an eternal perspective. What's going to last, what's going to matter? What do you really want in the end? What do you want to be known for, known by? You just want to be known that everybody knew he was a star athlete and, and, and people are destroyed in his wake? I mean, that's so dark, it's unbelievable. Amen points. Sport is about education. It's not only about education, but it is about education, life education, eternal education. It's about vision. You talk about having a 50-year impact. You know, I dealt mostly with college kids. And they were in their 20s, and the odds are they're going to live to their 70s in America. That'd be the average age. So we always talked about 50-year impact. It takes 50 years to make a man or a woman a God because it's a lifetime. You're both, when you're born again, you're, you're sanctified, but it's also... Uh, sanctification is a process. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So it's a process. There's a 50-year impact. There's a 50-year transformational process. That's what we're thinking about. We're not thinking about next season. We're thinking about decades. We're thinking about impact. We're thinking about reproduction. This is what we're thinking about in this philosophy. It's not just about the game or this team. It's about legacy. It's about the generations. It's not even about us. It's about our children and our children's children. This is how you think when you're thinking rightly, biblically. Dreams are what you see, but can't touch today. Goals are what you can touch today. It's important to have dreams, and it's important to have goals. Something you can touch today. To become a, a, a better husband or wife, a better father or mother, a better friend, a better worker today. There's a vision and dreams that you can see, but you can't touch. And then you have what you can touch today. They need to both be in place. You've got to have great vision. Got to have great dreams. People generally dream too small. And they dream for the wrong target. They dream about their glory instead of his glory. Bad dream. Vision. Their vision is about their exaltation instead of his. That's bad vision. But when you have dreams, his dreams, and his vision, then you're thinking about eternity. You're thinking about things that matter, things that last. These are the targets. If you got to get, you got to have a target that's out there that's God's target, and then you got to be on the track for that target. This is what we're talking about. 